Hello, singers. Just a few words again about confusing subjects. You have probably, either you have had or do have a teacher right now that tells you to sing in the mask. And you know what that means, except as the teacher explains it. Now, when Jean de Resque made this system pop popular at the turn of the 20th century, his Achante dans le masque was essential nasality. That's all it was. It was a lowering of the velum and a nasality of sound. Now, I can put anybody's, any of my students' voice on a, a format display, and I can show them how the nasalized voice has very little energy in it. It certainly won't carry. All of the partials below 1,000 hertz are blunted by nasality. Nasality being that which happens when the velum is lowered and sound leaks out of the vocal tract into the nose. The nose is filled with turbinates and very uh, cushion-like uh, uh, materials which are very good at blunting sound. And that is the essential effect of nasality. So one may sing this way with a high larynx because if you don't lower the larynx, the larynx will be high and the swallowing muscles attached to it will contract to give it some sort of pretense of support. Una furtiva lagrima meglio che Now, one may sing this way, that's right in the nose, and by Jean Dorès' example, that would be singing in the mass. You've all had to sing this. Caro mio ben, credi mio man. Okay. There we have a tune that you all had to learn, and it's sung straight into the mass. Now, do you, first of all, ask yourself, do you really want to make a sound like that? If you do, God bless you, but don't, don't leave your day job, okay? So then now I can direct the student how to use the breath properly by opening the mouth and having the jaw very loose the rigidity of the jaw will affect the larynx and affect also how the air in the vocal tract vibrates. Again, when you're afraid, you don't have a tight jaw. It just <laughs> opens. So when it opens and when the breath is properly taken with the diaphragm using the rib cage properly, then the larynx lowers to a comfortable degree whatever that is, for your larynx size, for the size of your pharynx, for the size of your mouth, it all varies according to individual morphology. My larynx lowers quite a long way. It lowered much further than this when I was younger because then my cartilages were all cartilage. Now my cartilages have almost turned to bone. From, 48, from the year of 40 years until 80 years, the body is undergoing what we call ossification. That is, all cartilage is, quick, is gradually turning to bone. So right now I don't have a thyroid cartilage, I have a thyroid bone. The difference between cartilage and bone is important. Uh, cartilage is very supple, very, very supple. Bone is rigid. So that's the main impediment to singing well at an old age. And you, everybody will tell you this. Jerome Hines told me this when I was young. And he said, well, Once you get to be 50, you'll see you've got to begin to use, be a little more careful with the way you use the voice. Now, he was a health nut. And he, took, he was a chemist. He took all sorts of supplements. He fasted twice a week. He only drank distilled water. He defeated ossification. At age 75, his thyroid cartilage was so supple that he could actually 
uh, reach in and bring the thyroid cartilage together in the back so that the horns of the thyroid actually touched one another. I've never seen a more supple larynx. And that is a lot of what enabled him to sing until he was 80 years old. I mean, sing really well. So then, we've got this large beginning air through a relaxed jaw. jaw. The larynx lowers and muscles, especially the sternothyroid muscles, are engaged to contract and to hold it in that position in a very easy way. And then another muscle, especially the stylopharyngeus muscle, contracts and pulls up. So the larynx is then suspended by opposite poles. It's a suspension system. So when the larynx is low, it's not just low, it is suspended by these opposite poles. And only certain muscles are designed to be the muscles used for these. So obviously this is all underneath conscious, uh, the conscious mind. You couldn't possibly direct all of this consciously. What some people do for a poor man's substitution is to push down on the back of the tongue to lower the larynx by squashing it from above. But it doesn't have the same impact. And one who sings that way Oh, has a very, very super dark, super throaty sound. We think of Russian basses singing this way, and some of them, in fact, do. So instead, when the larynx is properly lowered and properly suspended, and you get that feeling of suspension when you're not gripping the larynx, when you're not holding any uh, posture with rigidity and you use the diaphragm to gauge how much air should be used for the tone. That again is all unconscious <clears throat> or subconscious. So then that's the sound through the nose. Call me a bang. Now the sound of the speaking voice use for singing would be call all me a man. Well, not quite as bad, but also inaudible. The speaking voice cannot be used as a model for anything other than speech. That's why you don't want speech level singing. In speech, uh, there is no chiaro scuro tone. I, people mean well when they say these things. They mean to say they want you to be able to sing as easily as you speak. And that's a wonderful goal, but it will take most of us a while to get there. And we won't get there by imitating speech and putting it over in, into singing. Parisiamo is not very interesting. Neither is Parisiamo, the nasal version. Okay? Now, some of you say, oh, my teacher just wants me to add a little bit of that, not the whole thing. So it's be more like, Parisiamo. Well, even that's not very interesting, folks. Maybe you, you haven't gotten the, the velum fully dropped, so you've got some sound going into the nose, other sound coming out the mouth. But this is like, putting a leak in the garden hose. You know, if you take an ice pick and chop some holes in the garden hose, then it's going to leak water. And the water that comes out the end where you're trying to water the garden is going to be weak. That's the same thing in your speaking voice. If you lower the velum and some of the sound goes into the nose, it weakens the sound that comes out of the mouth. So it's highly inadvisable, besides the fact that it has lousy timbre. <clears throat> so we don't want to depress the larynx. We don't, don't want to sing in the nose. We don't want to sing half in the nose, half in the, in the vocal tract. We just want to sing in the vocal tract. We lower the larynx. We suspend the, the 
larynx by these feelings of two-way stretch. And the feelings that you receive will always have something to do with the actual mechanics. If you see, if you say, oh, I feel a long stretch in my legs when I do this, probably that's not really connected to your singing. But if you say, oh, when I do that, it feels like there's an elastic continuity in all the voice. Well, that would be an image which is connected to the actual truth of what's going on. So then, instead of parisiamo or parisiamo, we let it all come from the vocal tract. Parisiamo. And then we have the whole voice. So the whole voice is then chiaro scuro. It's clear and it's dark. Chiaro does not mean bright, it means clear. Oscuro means dark. It's dark because the larynx being lowered has lengthened the vocal tract and therefore the vocal tract produces lower frequency formants. It's like stretching the speech out. But when the, when the vocal formants are lowered, the upper three formants are connect are close enough together that they begin to cluster together and therefore they produce a big peak in that area. That's the squealo that everybody wants. That's the carrying power everybody wants. But even though you may feel it in your head, those vibrations in your head are just indications of what register you're in. They're very weak vibrations. In fact, yet to measure them at all, we have to use an electrical stethoscope. So obviously they can't be anything that's adding to the tone that comes out your mouth. So don't try to scrunch yourself up in an effort to get more of them. You'll just be twisting the vocal tract up and putting impedance into the sound like impedance in an electrical unit, this would be impedance in the sound. So there was a very famous voice teacher once who had his singers wrinkle up their nose and go, angry hangman, angry hangman. And of course to do that, wrinkling up the nose and drawing back the corners of the mouth and trying to make these sounds that distorted the whole contours of the vocal tract and put enormous amount of impedance within it. So he thought of that as an ingredient like salt in a cake. Then maybe you could put a little bit of that into your regular voice and get more ring. Well, all that does is it keeps your voice from being free because you're constantly trying to use impedance to create squealo or the vocal ring. That's a really bad way to think of vocal ring. Well now, especially since voice science and Johann Sundberg, and, uh, Richard Miller, uh, Tom Cleveland, all the big boys in voice science have measured the uh, amount of nasality in a uh, beautiful tone, they found it's negligible. But they've also discovered where the real ring is and what does affect it. So within the larynx, you know all about the internal thyroid muscles, the true vocal cords that connect to the front of the thyroid cartilage and to the back into the pyramid cartilages. Uh, the and there, we don't need to go into all the muscles, but you're aware of that. But above the true vocal cords, there are false vocal cords. And the cavity that's formed by those false vocal cords and the true vocal cords is called the, the ventricle, a cavity of Morgagni, after the guy who discovered it. So in speech, that, that 
ventricle is collapsed. And so it is impossible to speak with ring. If you want to speak with ring, you'd have to sing your voice. But what happens when the larynx is lowered and suspended in this net of muscles pulling up and down? Again, they're the sternothyroid and the stylopharyngeus muscles predominantly. None of the swallowing muscles are used. This is all the inhalation muscles. And the swallowing muscles have to be quiet. All they're good for is to keep you from choking. Their design is to batten down the hatches, to close the larynx, squeeze the larynx, and pull it up so the food will drop behind into your esophagus and not to your trachea. So therefore, those swallowing muscles are not suspensory muscles to be used in singing. But if you then have this suspension, and you maintain the relaxed jaw, so no tensation there affects the way the air vibrates, then you don't have, ah, you don't have, ah, you don't have, ah, you have, Now, somebody says, oh my, wasn't that voice going into the mask? Well, I did have feelings in the head, but usually they're further back and higher than where most people identify mask feelings. It's certainly higher than what Jean the rest called the mask. And some people give a, a title to these feelings, the up and over or whatever. I don't like to give titles to feelings because they may be very personal. Caruso purportedly had sensations in his legs for his dinos. I have no idea what that means. I have no interest in trying to describe some phantom leg resonance. But Caruso also did something very interesting in that he claimed that I place my high notes down low at the nape of the neck. Now what on earth would that mean? We could figure that sensation out. We could, and we might be right, because when the larynx is low for head voice, it tilts, uh, the thyroid cartilage tilts a great deal forward and the cricoid is pulled back and down further. So there is this shifting of stretching and then back and down. That puts the larynx very close to the backbone. And since the vibrations on the larynx are very strong, some of those vibrations get transferred to the backbone and rise by bone conduction uh, up into the skull. So you may be aware of those things happening, and that may be a good way for you to test whether or not you're singing properly. I'd suggest you just record yourself and listen. But if you want to use these feelings, then you can do that. So we could sing those high notes in a variety of positions that brighten the voice. Al And some people may think, hey, that's pretty good. Until you hear the real sound. head voice seems to be connected to the chest in that it is what the Italians call in vocal registration it's what they call la voce completa or 
the true voice in the head <laughs> as we distinguish it from Paul saying it. It's all called, also called la voce piena in testa, the voice full in the head as to distinguish it from and we all have this false echo. Occasionally someone, someone like Ivan Rebrov even develops it, so it's a very beautiful sound. He could go clear up to a soprano high A in that beautiful false echo. But most of us don't develop it. Uh, it's not used in good taste in singing unless it's some little tiny section for a bufo. But generally speaking, we use two registers, chest and full chest and full head. There's no nasal register, there's no mask register, there's no larynx register. We have these two. So, the high notes as you see are, I think also again here, sound waves come out from the larynx as concentric circles like when you throw a pebble into the pond and you see circles coming out in all directions. Sound waves happen like that too. So when the larynx creates sound waves uh, from its action of the air coming into it from the lungs, when, when the larynx creates sound waves, they go in all directions too. They're going down uh, into the lungs and they're going up into the vocal tract and either out your mouth or out your nose and your mouth, depending on how well you sing. But because the vocal tract uh, has a certain shape, the, uh, the voice, the, the sound waves follow the shape of the vocal tract. That's the process that gives us vowel. So the shape of the vocal tract determines the vowel. But because the vocal tract and the larynx have what we call reciprocal sen sensitivity, the way the vocal tract is shaped will feed back and have an impact on the larynx function. So laryngologists, for example, do see small laryngeal shifts uh, in positioning and adductive values in the vocal cords uh, using fiber optic uh, laryngoscope, they see different relationships within the larynx for different vowels. And that's because of the super sensitivity of the vocal tract and the larynx, how they work one another. So that means that if you form pure vowels, which also means you have to adjust them, don't forget that, if you form pure vowels in the vocal tract, it will make your larynx function even better. And as it functions better, you begin to reach peak efficiency for your instrument. And then you can sing with peak efficiency. Right now, I'm not able to sing with peak efficiency because part of my instrument has been destroyed by medical malpractice, sorry to say. My lungs cannot hold enough air to do the process that we call operatic singing. I only have about one liter of air in my lungs because of malpractice. And so everything I demonstrate has to be very short. But even though it is short, it's still the same voice that I've always had. Instead of being able to sing a 15 second uh, or more uh, phrase on one breath, now I can only sing about two or three seconds for a phrase. But it's the same voice. So it's still being used at peak efficiency, but the instrument has been partially destroyed. <laughs> So there is the voice moving with the low larynx through the vocal tract and being 
enhanced by that laryngeal resonance, the ventricle of Morgagni uh, be begins to have uh, a real impact on the singing voice. <clears throat> That's why the positioning and the expansion of the low larynx is essential, at least for men, probably for women too, but at least for men, it's essential. Because without it, you won't get any real timbre or any real um, effective, uh, audible, ringing voice. So if you want to go... You have to do that with your real voice, which is produced in the suspended larynx, and the ventricle of Magani being small, resonates and amplifies higher the higher partials of that laryngeal tone, and that's been called the 2800. It's just uh, an average. Actually, I think my the larynx resonance is around 2600, but it does vary from 2.2k to even 3.6k in some people. But that is the source of it. Instead of believing that the source is sinus resonance and trying to scrunch yourself up in some way, if you could, to get more sinus resonance, that will just that will just uh, put a noose around your neck. It will disable you it, because you will have put so much impedance into the vocal resonator, the vocal tract. Now, that same note, nasally, ah, 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 let's put it up higher. It's very hard to control pitch that high in the nose. Not very good. So we won't do that. And if we talk the way that we were singing then, we would be talking like this, almost like I had helium in my lungs instead of air. But the larynx would be that high, and it would be pulled up there by the swallowing muscles. And so then you would be singing, Call me a man, crave me a man. And I guarantee you, you won't win any audition singing that way. Now that might win you something. Hopefully though you'll choose a better aria than Cotton Lou Ben. This is just for demonstration. I hope this has been clarifying to you. Nasality is not vocal rain. Brightness is not the goal. The goal is clear darkness, chiaroscuro. And it's accomplished by using the voice in the way it evolved as a noisemaker in when when we were on the savannas just moving from our ape ancestors into hominids oh oh uh, 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 uh. warning for an animal nearby <laughs> warning of chimps nearby oh, 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 oh. Uh, an unspecific warning of danger nearby. So if you think of all of the animals on the savannas, the larynx literally evolved to be able to make noises that would, that would give the hominid the ability to make warning sounds for those animals. 
That's why the larynx can produce so many kinds of timbre. But it can't do that if you use it in speech. Ah, ah, oh, hey, ah. But no one's going to get warned by that kind of a sound. So it just happens that the breath for fright is exactly the same breath that bel canto asks us to do by relaxing the jaw, drawing in a full, uh, a full breath, which is just below the tip top that you can put into the lungs. And then our voice training takes over. The uh, center of the brain that is controlling all of these factors, it, it controls message to the muscles, it controls messages to the diaphragm, to the to every aspect of the singing system. It is in the right temporal lobe. This has been discussed uh, a great deal by uh, by a physician uh, um, named Wyke, and uh, Richard Miller quotes Wyke right at quite a lot. Wyke has studied uh, all of the physiological aspects of singing and he's a neurologist, so it's right up his alley. alley. And Wyke said that there is a sort of like a software within the brain in the right temporal lobe. That's why it's so difficult for us to experience it because most of us are not gifted in utilizing the right temporal lobe. What could assist one in being more sensitive to the right temporal lobe? I'll give you some ideas, and they have nothing to do with standard voice uh, teacher uh, drills. You could practice stillness. You could go into nature if you like nature. You could practice above all meditation, any kind of meditation. You could do something as simple as devote a certain amount of time to looking at clouds or looking at or daydreaming even. All of these things are right-brained activities. And uh, even the place of this software is very near the place in the brain where very supernatural things, seemingly supernatural things occur in the Sylvan Fisher. So it's not odd that we view singing as a very holy event. To hold a kunst, it is a very holy and wonderful event to sing. It first enabled us to survive the savannas and to evolve. And then it enabled us to make a great culture, to make songs and to make art. And you're all a part of that. You're a part of our building block, our evolution on this planet, from noisemakers to opera singers. And the same basic usage of the larynx and the other parts is there for the opera singing as was there for noisemaking. So just to round up, round it all up, the voice has a power supply in the heart and the lungs. It has a vibrator, which also acts sort of like um, a transmission in the larynx. And it has a resonator in the vocal tract, the combination of the throat and the mouth put together as a curved vocal tract. So that's the machine. It doesn't have any nuts or bolts. It has instead nerves, cartilages, bones, flesh, all sorts of complicated tissue. Uh, and it can produce the miracle of a party or a party. You make your own choice, which you'd rather have. But if you choose the second one, People will enjoy it, and it will carry. In the largest houses in the world, I've sung the prologue in the largest 
and some of the livest and also some of the deadest theaters in the world. And it never, never failed to carry, even in the dead houses. And let me tell you, they are not fun to sing in. Because you get no feedback. Then you hear the tape made from the audience, and wow, that carried like gangbusters. So hopefully you won't have to sing in a dead theater, but you do need to sing well. And I hope I've helped a little bit on that particular goal. Bye-bye.